I know I'm going to check my sound first, but I know this is sort of a special mid-afternoon thing I'm doing here. And, uh, but I think you'll enjoy it anyway. Now, I did a show this morning, so please uh, uh, hang on. Let me check my sound. Yeah, looks like my sound is up. Okay. So, where am I? There I am. Today, uh, August uh, 9th, 20 years ago today, uh, there was a Notocon, uh, OTO National Convention, in uh, Troutdale, in Port near Portland, uh, Oregon. And uh, even back then, 20 years ago, there I, I had a, uh, a talk. Uh, and uh, it was one of my most uh, 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 fun ones to, uh, uh, to, to present. And so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to share that speech that I did 20, 20 years ago today. And uh, the, the reason, another reason I'm doing it is because the Polish OTO publishes this wonderful, slick, beautiful, colorful uh, magazine every quarter uh, for the Polish-speaking uh, uh, OTO members and for uh, other people that speak Polish. And I showed you this uh, f uh, from uh, Notocon just a couple days ago, but uh, it's called survival. That's what that word means there. And uh, there's a few pictures. And uh, they, they told me that they published what I'm about to give you in English. They published that in Polish. So there's uh, uh, me with Helen Parson Smith. All these uh, people I, I mentioned in the, in the speech. And here is the beloved... Grady McMurtry in his full splendor and here he is again in World War II just after invading uh, he's in France there just after the D-Day invasion he was in that and there's one more there's a uh, picture of him on the on the day he chartered chartered Haru Raha Lodge OTO. So I can't read Polish. <laughs> but here's what I said. Are you ready? It's called survival. The first and last ordeal of initiation. Now this is going to be interesting for OTO people in particular. But I'm not going to say anything proprietary or give away any signs or grips or secret words or anything. So I hope you enjoy it. An address to the 2003 National OTO Convention in Portland, Oregon, August 9th, 2003. So when I uh, mention dates here, just tag 20 years on to the dates. I'm 55 years old. Well, I'm 75 years old. And I spent 28 of those years in the OTO. Well, now we can, we can uh, easily say 48 of those years. In those years, I've earned some of the highest honors the order can bestow. And on several occasions over the year, I've also been encouraged to resign and threatened with expulsion. I've witnessed what I consider the darkest moments in the Order's history and the most glorious. Within the magical crucible of OTO politics, I've learned profound lessons in patience, courtesy, honor, and ruthlessness. 
I've made deep and enduring friendships and suffered the most despicable acts of personal and fraternal betrayal. The OTO ruined my chances at being elected president. It has scarred my chest, ruined my back, and robbed my sleep. The order has given me a liberal arts education and is responsible for my writing career. Because of the OTO, I've traveled to England and Germany and Norway and Brazil and Canada and Mexico. And um, after that, I should, should add things like Japan and all over Europe. Haruraha Lodge okay, is currently inactive, but we hope to move back to Costa Mesa and reactivate it. Haru Raha Lodge has been our extended family for over 25 years, 45 years, providing colorful, loving, and generous uncles and aunts for our son, Jean-Paul. The OTO is my heart's delight, but only when it's not breaking my heart. Through it all, I've never once considered resigning. It's not because I'm so strong or dedicated or wise. It's simply because the OTO is not something I belong to. It is something that belongs to me. It is something that I am. It's not easy being in the OTO, but the OTO, but being in the OTO is easy. All you have to do is survive. For as it is written, and this is a goofy paraphrase of, a, of something Crowley wrote, so uh, Thelemites uh, and magicians can easily uh, uh, identify what, uh, <laughs> what uh, uh, piece of literature here I'm, I'm uh, corrupting. For as it is written, Thou then who meetest jerks and assholes, rejoice because of them, for in them is strength, and by their means is a pathway open unto that light. How should it be otherwise, O human unit, whose life is but a day in eternity, a drop in the ocean of time? How were the idiots not many, couldst thou purge thy soul from the dross of earth? Is it now, is it but now that the higher life is beset with dolts and morons? Hath it not ever been so with the sages and hierophants of the past? They have been ignored and insulted, they have been tormented of governing bodies, yet through this also has their glory increased. Rejoice, therefore, O initiate, for in the OTO, the greater thy trial, the greater thy triumph. And survival is the first and last ordeal of initiation. On November 15th, 1975, before there was a Grand Lodge, before there was an Areopagus or a Supreme Grand Council, before Grand Tribunals or Electoral Colleges, before Notocons, I received my Minerval initiation in a two-car garage in Dublin, California. My initiators were two surviving ninth degree members of the old Agape Lodge, Grady L. McMurtry and his then wife, Phyllis Seckler McMurtry. Only the three of us were present. It rained that night, so plans for a backyard ceremony had to be changed. I traveled by bus all night before. I was 27 years old. Constance and I had been married for eight years, and our son Jean-Paul was three. I didn't have a job a car, or the slightest scrap of ambition. 
To raise the money for the bus ticket, I sold my tape recorder and a few of my precious books. Once in Dublin, I had to stay at a motel because there were concerns I might be a mass murderer or some kind of occult crazy. Security dictated that I was not to know the address of my initiation, where my initiation was to be held. This made me very nervous because I still had many questions and doubts about Crowley and the type of people who worshipped him. <laughs> Throughout the 12-hour bus trip, my imagination ran wild. I knew there were real possibilities that goats m might be involved or that I'd be raped in Eden. When I arrived to the motel, I called the phone number I was given. Phyllis answered. The first thing she said after I identified myself was, Have you eaten? Cautiously, I answered, No, have you? When Phyllis... <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. Okay. I exaggerate all over the place, but I, that happened just like that. When Phyllis arrived to pick me up, I was very relieved. So was she. She took me to her gingerbread house, fed me lunch, and talked all afternoon about Crowley and Thelema and the OTO. Grady came home in the late afternoon, but I didn't see much of him until after the ceremony, or until the ceremony, excuse me. It was awesome, the most magical event of my life. Grady looked like a god. No, Grady was god at the time. Phyllis stu stood by and supported me like my holy guardian angel. For years later, I'd still wonder how each of them could so completely veil their glory when not in temple. At my, at my Minerval dinner, I listened to stories of survival. How after receiving the ninth degree from Aleister Crowley, Grady survived D-Day and Korea. How Phyllis and Grady each had survived the wild Agape Lodge days and the years when Carl Germer refused to initiate new members into the post-Crowley OTO. How only they, Helen Parsons Smith and perhaps two others of the old lodge, had survived to see 1975. Finally, Gr Grady brought out an old leg translation of the Yi Ching that had once belonged to Crowley. Crowley had painted oriental scenes in oils on the front and back cover, and the pages were filled with his handwritten notes and corrections. When Grady unwrapped, then Grady unwrapped another treasure, Crowley's own Yi Ching sticks, six flat wooden sticks, one side blank and one side with a red line running vertically down the center. I was very impressed. He offered to let me consult the oracle. I asked, what is the OTO to me? The answer is number seven, the army. Constance took her Minerva a few months later. I took my first degree a little over six months after that and the, at the same location by the same individuals. This time, Phyllis and Grady were assisted by our beloved late sister, Helen Parsons Smith. I believe it was the last initiation Phyllis and Grady would perform together. They had already separated. The split was bitter. Neither of them could decide who should get the mail addressed to the OTO, so for a while they agreed that the mail would be forwarded to me and I would open and decide who sh should get what. For a while, I didn't know whether the tiny OTO would survive. Grady moved to Berkeley, and with the heroic help of brother Bill Heydrich, Shireen and Sister Shireen, 
and others, they started to initiate Minervals. At first, that was all he could do because an important piece of initiation equipment necessary for other man of earth cer ceremonies was still at Phyllis's home in Dublin. This piece of equipment is very large and heavy and, well, most of us will know what I'm talking about. The absence of this piece of equipment meant that if I wanted to take my second degree and Constance wanted to take her first degree, I was going to have to build or have someone build one of those contraptions and ship it from Costa Mesa to Berkeley. So that's what I did because survival is the first last ordeal of initiation. My second degree place uh, took place in a large uh, tent in the backyard of the old San Pablo house in Emeryville. Phyllis and Helen did not attend, so there was only a handful of new Minervals available to help Grady as officers. Prior to the ceremony, Grady invited me to inspect the temple. And joining me in the inspection of the temple and the secret device was a little boy, the son of one of the other members. He couldn't have been more than seven years old. The little rascal took great delight in telling me the dramatic details of precisely how that piece of equipment was going to be used in my initiation. He completely spoiled, because I hadn't read ahead. I didn't, I didn't know what the initiation was about, but this little boy told me, okay. Things were a little lax at the Emeryville Temple. Was I disappointed that I was robbed of the full psychic impact of the initiatory surprise by a seven-year-old child? Of course not. I've forgotten all about it. And survival is the first and last ordeal of initiation. It's here that I need to point out I was initiated so early in the cycle of the order's rebirth that I was curiously blessed by the fact that after my first degree, all my initiations would be the first ever conferred by a post Crowley OTO. In addition to that, as years passed, Constant Aunt Constance caught up with me, most of our higher degree initiations would be the first ever performed in the history of the entire order. It was quite an honor. But with this blessing came a curse. My first clue that this was a curse came on the evening and morning of my third degree initiation. As it was the first third degree Grady had ever officiated, it was naturally spiced with some of his very curious interpretations of signs, which Grady dubbed the cosmic hitchhiker and the grip, which included a bizarre act of contorting, of co contortion that positioned Grady and me bent over our backs toward the ceiling, ass to ass holding hands. Believe me, I, I did not just disclose any, <laughs> any, any secret, but it still was accurate. Okay. I'll be happy to demonstrate this later to those of you who are at least third degree. Uh, to Grady's credit, you'll see that as crazy as it looks, it's, it's still an accurate but highly unlikely interpretation of the directions. Okay. The ceremony, which should have lasted less than 90 minutes, took nearly five hours. Ask Constance. She was waiting in the next room. She was sure they actually killed me in there. The length of the ceremony was due in large to the heroic but misguided efforts of an officer who Grady temporarily raised for the evening, who misread the instructions in his old fragmented script. Oaths prevent me from sharing the details in an open group like this, so let me state that instead of simply reading a few lines from A to line G of a certain one of Crowley's plays, as I would later discover Crowley's directions indicated, the dear man 
read the entire play. He even used he even used props and ethnic voices to distinguish different cast characters. Needless to say, Grady and the other officers fell asleep during the first act, and only I was left awake to enjoy the performance. The most disturbing part of the evening came when I was actually given the all-important word of the third degree. It didn't make sense. Uh, it was stupid. Uh, even I knew it was incorrect. It had to be wrong. But was I disappointed that I was needlessly assaulted for hours by a one-man play and raised by the wrong freaking word? A word after shaking hands anus to anus? <laughs> of course not. I've forgotten all about it. As a matter of fact, that very same evening, Grady gave me the ninth degree, consecrated me Bishop of EGC, and activated my Lodge chapter, charter and my authorization to initiate. I guess that anus to anus stuff really works. The first thing I did when I got home from my third degree was to figure out the correct word of the third degree and the Latin phrase that went with it. It wasn't hard. I proudly wrote Grady with the details and he immediately recognized the lost word of the degree. And since that point, everyone in the OTO at the third degree is raised with the, the word. I realized from that moment that if Constance and I were going to survive the OTO, if we ever expected to receive initiations that at least resembled what Crowley had in mind, I was going to have to research, reconstruct, organize, and direct our own ceremonies. And from then on, that's just what I did. I even made our own jewels, aprons, and other regalia that would eventually be presented to us. I had to because survival is the first and last ordeal of initiation. Constance and I were privileged to have Hymenaeus Alpha 777 Grady McMurtry officiate the degree ceremonies of all but the last few of our OTO initiations. And that's because he died before we took those initiations. He was a dear soul and one of the most interesting and colorful people I have ever met. Crowley chose well when he chose Grady McMurtry to lead the OTO. He wrote Grady that he wanted a soldier someone properly blooded, someone who had experienced war as it was actually fought to lead the OTO through a crisis that he correctly predicted would begin in the early 1960s. I believe Crowley knew that if the OTO were, were to survive this crisis, it would need a very particular kind of leader, someone who takes command in the field when the other officers have been killed. Someone who can survive and lead long enough to complete the mission. And that's just what Grady did. When the death of Carl Germer in 1962 threatened to plunge the order into extinction. The OTO is here today because of Grady's courage and his willingness to offer up the last years of his life in the struggle to assure the OTO's survival and with it the survival of the work of our Holy Prophet. This is not to say that he was without his shortcomings. Grady had many, a few of which caused varying degrees of trauma to those around him. He knew that survival was the first and last ordeal of initiation. And for many of us, the first thing you needed to survive in the OTO was Grady. 
I'm going to recheck my sound because I want to make sure that we're hearing all of this. Um, because as you know, sometimes my sound, okay, my sound is still up. Good. So the first thing you needed to survive was Grady. For one thing, he smoked tobacco. Uh, now I know a lot of people smoke tobacco, but very few people smoke Perique tobacco. It's one of the strongest, foulest tobacco on the planet. Crowley smoked it. Grady smoked it. Constance and our son Jean-Paul cannot physically tolerate tobacco smoke. But Grady was our caliph, and in our early ass-kissing years of the OTO, as opposed to our later ass-kissing years in the OTO, uh, we could not bring ourselves to ask Grady to smoke outside whenever he visited our home. Instead, on those occasions, Constance and Jean-Paul slept in a pup tent in our backyard. Grady also drank. So much so, it became not only a major health problem for himself personally, but an organizational and magical problem for those around him. Early in my career as an initiatory, it became painfully obvious. As a matter of fact, on the very first occasion I official, officiated officiated a Minerval initiation at Haru Raha. Grady and Shireen traveled down to Costa Mesa to witness Constance and I do the initiation. We were very excited and more than a little nervous. We were well aware of Grady's love of drink. And we certainly wanted to show him a good time, but we were also concerned that our three new Minerval candidates would come away with a good first impression of our Caliph. We knew we couldn't keep him from drinking, but we did our best to keep it light. We bought a whole bunch of miniature cans of Olympia beer, and in California that's like a little more than three, two, okay, so. During the day, we saw that he was getting uneasy. When we saw he was getting uneasy, I'd toss him a tiny cold one. And we kept him fed on deviled eggs and other snacks uh, to keep his stomach full. It looked like he was going to work. And by the time the candidates arrived, Grady was his most charming and awesome self, which is really him. Just prior to the ceremony, Constance, Shireen, and I sat down with Grady to discuss the ritual script. Part of the ceremony of the script indicated that the uh, uh, initiatory was to address both men and women candidates in a, in a particular way, a certain way. Uh, elsewhere in the script, Crowley wrote that if the candidate were a woman, the obvious changes in the wording of the address should be made. Grady agreed that the change should be made and that I should make the change in that night's ceremony. I even said, okay, when I get to the part where I'm going to say, quote, yada, 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 it, yes, it was agreed, I would say, yada, 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 okay. Everything was said. We all robed up and I took my place. Grady and Shireen sat on pillows stage left of me. Then Grady got up, left the room. When he came back, he had one of our giant ice tea tumblers and a brown paper sack. He sat back down, took a fifth of Christian Brothers brandy out of the sack and poured it in the tumbler. I still remember the, the sound. <laughs> I looked around to see the giant glass 
was filled to the meniscus with a hundred proof brandy. I sent Constance out to get the first candidate, a woman, and before she returned, I heard the sounds of a master chugger swallowing for what any other man on earth would be a toxic dose of alcohol. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. The first candidate entered, and I began to speak my lines. Just as I discussed and rehearsed earlier with before Grady and Shireen and Constance. Quote, yada, 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 yada. <coughs> then, from my left, I hear what sounds like a combination of Grady's voice and the voice of Linda Blair in The Exorcist, going, you chicken shit. You b bastard. Do you think I was upset that my experience as an initiator was turned into such a hideous nightmare? Of course not. I've forgotten all about it. And survival is the first and last ordeal of initiation. Grady mercifully fell asleep, or should I say passed out, uh, for most of the next two candidates. Now, I once heard someone say that Grady McMurtry never apologized for anything. They're wrong. The next day when Constance, Shireen, and I gently confronted him with the fact that I spoke precisely the words he wanted me to speak, he poignantly and most graciously apologized to us all. And even if he hadn't, Grady didn't choose Grady McMurtry for his manners or his temperament or his temperance or administration, administrating uh, experience or his social skills. Grady chose him for battle, to fight the battles to preserve the OTO. And that's just what Grady McMurtry continued to do right up until the moment he died. I wish you all could have known him. I think it's fitting that we salute our great hero of Thelema with a ovation. And we all stood and gave a battery uh, applause of 353. Then when we sat down, Survival is also the first and last ordeal of being a child of OTO parents. Our son Jean-Paul, who is now 31, read 51, is married and living in Hawaii. Read Macau, China, with a son of his own. He was three when we first joined, so most for the most part, he can't remember when he wasn't an OTO orphan. He wasn't really an orphan. We let him be part of everything. Everything but the initiation ceremonies themselves. His flashcards were tarot cards. He knew the names of all the trumps and the Hebrew letters that went with them. I can still hear him saying, The High Priestess! When he was three, we lived in a very small one-bedroom apartment. Constance and I slept in the living room, and Jean-Paul got the bedroom. But Jean-Paul was a good sport. 
He allowed me on occasions to tape out a circle and triangle on his carpet, bedroom carpet, and conjure goetic demons at the foot of his bed. When we moved to a bigger house, Jean-Paul again had to be a good sport and share his room with, OT, uh, with the OTO. His room was now the dining room area, which connected both the living room and the kitchen. The kitchen was also connected to the hallway that led to our bedroom, which we transformed into the Minerva Temple. On initiation nights, we'd have to wait until Jean-Paul fell asleep then Constance would quietly prepare the candidate in the living room and silently lead them past our little sleeping angel through the kitchen and the hallway into the initiation chamber. As he grew up, he experienced Gnostic masses, magic classes, rites of Eleusis, parties, lots of parties, some of them pretty wild, with men in goat fur leggings and ravaging maenads in our bathtub. That was awful. Nobody could get in the bathroom and pee. It took a long time for, to get the goat fur out of our bathtub. Throughout all of these impressionable years, Jean-Paul kept a diary. When he was older and in high school, he shared a few... <laughs> entries from his diary of an OTO kid. I'll change a few things not to incriminate anyone. One of the most memorable uh, entries went something like two women from uh, Alaska, let's say, came for their OTO initiation. One of them got drunk and fell in love with Amanda. She threw up and passed out on my bed. He even had an OTO bar mitzvah of sort. The day before he started high school, the lodge presented the right of soul, one of the seven rites of Eleusis. We held it in our backyard, and it, as always, is always quite an event. If you're familiar with the rite of soul, you'll remember that Saul has a pretty easy time of it. All he has to do is sit there and look like the sun god until they crucify him and throw him in a box. We asked Jean-Paul if he would like to dress up like a sun god and be crucified. He didn't want to do it at first, but when we told him it'd be like his bar mitzvah, after the ceremony we'd let him drag his cross around and guess would all pin money to it. He liked that idea. We had our little sun god, and at the end of the day, Jean-Paul pulled in about 75 bucks off his cross. I hope I haven't bored you too much with my tales of life in the OTO. The OTO that Constance and I and Jean-Paul grew up in is in many ways much different than the organization that we belong to today. Not only that, we've become very different people. It's clear to me that our involvement in the order changed the OTO as much as the OTO changed us. When all is said and done, I believe that's exactly what's supposed to happen to us all. Initiation means a beginning. Each one of us changes the OTO the moment we enter her ranks. At that moment, the OTO becomes uniquely our own. And our actions, our growth, directly affects the character and the life of the order. There comes a time in our initiatory careers when we are informed in no uncertain terms that what may happen in the future, we will always be linked to the order. That doesn't mean that we can't resign or quit or go inactive or be expelled. Of course we can. It simply means that we've been initiated, truly initiated, and no matter what the objective circumstances of our life may be, nothing can take that initiation from us. We are changed.
No, more than that. We have begun. We have begun an unstoppable process of changing that will eventually take each and every one of us to the summit of spiritual evolution. For I am divided for love's sake, for the chance of union. This is the creation of the world, that the pain of division is as nothing, and the joy of disillusion all. No matter how much we screw up, no matter how many toes we step on, no matter how many hearts we break, we've been initiated. We have begun. So remember, when thou art a jerk and asshole, pray that your brethren will rejoice because of you. For because of you they will become strong. And by your shameful Example, will a pathway be open unto that light? How should it be otherwise? How wert thou not at times a complete moron could others purge their souls from the dross of earth? Is it now that the higher life is beset with buffoons such as thou? Nay. It's ever been so with the sages and hierophants of the past. They have been ignored and insulted. They have been misunderstood and tormented by self-centered dolts, just like thou. Yet through this also has their glory increased. Rejoice, therefore, O initiate, for you're not alone. Rejoice in the sure knowledge that you are just as big a pain in the ass to your brothers and sisters as you, they are to you. We need each other. And we need for each other to survive. For in the OTO, the greater our trial, the greater our triumph. And survival is the first and last ordeal of initiation. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will. That little talk was delivered 20 years ago today. Anyway, hopefully there will be a regular show tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Until then, be good to yourself and be good to each other.